Good evening, everybody. My name is Arlene Grossman, and I am substituting as the moderator for tonight's webinar for Glenn Grossman, um, substituting for Rebecca Berman. She unfortunately was not able to make it this week, but in the next in the two more weeks when we meet again, she will be the moderator once again. So I'd like to go ahead and give you um, the information about Glenn's history. Glenn Grossman is an epidemiologist with over 20 years of experience. While pursuing his doctorate in epidemiology at UNC Chapel Hill, Glenn served as epidemiologist on staff at the UNC Infectious Disease Clinic for two years and taught epidemiology and advanced analytics at Duke Medical School and UNC. He has been involved in epidemiology forecasting and advanced analytics with Bristol-Myers Squibb, Sanofi, Novartis, Medicare, Medicaid, Veterans Health Administration, Military, Military Health Service, CDC, and other programs with, within the United States and abroad. All views expressed today are his own. Okay. Thanks, Arlene. Sure. Okay, if you could please do as you usually do, Glenn, and tell us globally what's going on, and then we'll go to questions. Sure. All right, let me share my screen. Uh, let me redo this. Give me one second. Um, it closed. All right, I should be able to share my screen. All right, so here's where we stand so far. Let me move this out of the way so I can see. All right, so here is where we were um, back a, a month ago, June 20th. You can see how the, how the United States has changed. This is the risk level, which includes uh, both the percentage of vaccination rates as well as, or, or essentially the unvaccinated people, as well as the caseload that's going on. Um, and so what we're seeing here is that there's been a big increase uh, from June 20th to June uh, from June 20th to July 20th. Now, if you compare June July 20th to five days later, uh, it is now um, it is now July 25th. Uh, you can see that there's been some even some more spread. Um, we are looking at this regionally. So, so you see, really, it makes most sense at a county level. Um, some states are being hit harder than others. But really, even within the hard hit states, like Texas, for instance, there's a green county, um, but then there's also purple counties, which are the worst. Um, similarly, in some other states uh, where it's mostly pretty good, like Montana, there's a purple state. So we really need to look at, at a county by county level. But it's important to separate this out because there are state specific policies and, and, and public health agencies, as well as county level interventions. And so therefore, because there's different uh, policies that take place at these different levels, it's important that we need to understand how they occur at different levels. <clears throat> the United States as a whole, um, so we've been talking about these different surges. I guess we're now sort of on the fifth surge. Uh, we had that first one, the, the major one, which isn't represented in the data very well, the testing wasn't taking place very well back then, but March, April of last year. Then we had the summer surge last year, which was primarily in the South, um, then we had the big surge in this, uh, the past winter fall. Then there was this other minor surge. I mean, it, there was still quite a lot of people that got infected and, and died, but relative to the fall and winter, it was quite a bit less. Uh, you can see the, the yellow is the hospitalization, uh, the percentage of hospitalization visits or emergency department visits, which were um, related to COVID. And then now what we see <clears throat> is that we have this increase due to Delta uh, that's taking place, and the hospitalization rates are rising as well. Mm. So, um, so this is where we are in terms of the states. Um, so first, we're looking at transmissibility here, how, how much transmission is going on in different places. And you see that there is a dramatic regional variation that's going on here. Um, so if there's a regional variation at a high level, even within the states, you can see that there's within the regions that there's that there's a, a pretty big clusters. But then again, going back to what we were just looking at um, here with the um, with the counties, you see that there's very wide variation even within the counties. Um, when we're looking over here, let me go back to this. 
All right, so here's what we're looking at with the vaccination rates. Um, so vaccines uh, are also regionally distributed essentially um, with the Northeast doing the best. It varies a little bit right now. We're looking at the percentage of people fully vaccinated above the age of 18. Above the age of 65, uh, it's, a, it's a great indicator of the people at highest risk. Um, and so, I mean, some of these states, look at Vermont, 95% of people uh, over the age of 65 are fully vaccinated, uh, which is great. When you look at New York, it's 80%, New Jersey, 82%. It varies widely. And so when you look at Alabama, it's only 70% um, and Arkansas is 67%. So it, it gets really low. Um, Florida is 80, 80%, so almost, almost up to uh, where New Jersey and some of these others are near. Uh, getting there, but but these numbers are still quite low. And so if you if you're talking about 20% of the population age 65 and over are not vaccinated, then that you're talking about these people potentially being at risk as if they were as if it were March or April of 2020. Um, mm -hmm. Presumably, some of these people will have at least one dose, which does give them some some protection. So you can see 91% of people in Florida. Do have one dose, and and I think roughly we were assuming at this govern at the federal level, so across the whole country. Um, I think we're talking about roughly thirty. Let me see. I pulled this number out. So roughly thirty eight percent have been previously infected at this point. So ever infected has been thirty eight percent since uh, March of of, of twenty twenty, um, and so this implies between the vaccinations and the and the previously infected. That around 27 percent, so roughly one in four Americans, are um, have no existing immune protection and are at risk now with the Delta variant. That's an enormous number of people, mm -hmm. um, and so so this is uh, troublesome. Luckily, the vast majority of these people are under the age of 65. Just as a reminder, this sometimes comes up. So we looked at this uh, many months ago in terms of the risk. Let me see if I can pull it up again real quickly. So here's the risk that we're looking at here. This was a good estimate of the infection fatality rate by age. So if you're looking at age 85 and over, on average, the estimate this was published uh, months ago, uh, based on what, on what uh, in October of 2020 is when it was first uh, published. Um, and so they estimated that among people 85 and over, for every person infected, roughly 28% of them would ultimately die. So age 75 to 84, it was 8%, no, 8 to 9%. Age 65 to 74, it was 2.5%. But then you see it dramatically drops uh, below that. So uh, people aged 55 to 64, less than 1%, it was 0.75%. For people aged 45 to 54, it was uh, a quarter of 1%. 35 to 44, was 0.068%. So you get into much, much smaller risk categories. And then for people under the age of 35, we're talking about 0.004%. And so particularly among prepubescent kids, that it, as a percentage of the total of these of the age under, under age 35, the risk levels are really, really quite small. And so this continues to be the case as far as we know. Um, with the Delta variant. The Delta variant does increase, not only is it increasing how contagious it is, the primary reason that it's so, uh, so much more contagious is because uh, the amount of virus it produces is dramatically increasing. We're, in, we're uh, estimating that's increasing the viral load in people by maybe 10 times, so a thousand percent. Um, and so this is this is an enormous increase in the amount of viral shedding that's taking place as a result. Um, previously, we, there was a strong correlation between the amount of virus that people produced and the immune response. And so the, and the immune response was what triggered most of the massive symptoms. There was some clotting and other things that occurred because of the virus itself, simply the ACE2 receptor. Uh, but much of the symptoms was, was really due to the immune response, the cytokine storms, this kind of stuff, rather than the virus itself. And so the fact that there's so much more virus load um, could potentially increase the severity of the disease, uh, but the jury is still out on that part. Um, so let me go back to a couple other things that we wanted to discuss about where we are. So unfortunately, uh, the vaccines have not really changed. The vaccination rate hasn't really changed a lot from June 
uh, of June 20th to July 20th. And so the last month hasn't, we, people haven't been taking advantage of that time to protect themselves from Delta. And so this is, this is still worrisome. Um, in terms of what we're looking at, let me, let me go to the actual website here. So, um, oh, so be, going back for a second, the regional variation, you can see, I mean, you saw it clearly on the maps, but you can see it uh, even more clearly here. So the South is really driving it like we saw last summer, similarly the West and then the Midwest. But what's unique here is that we are seeing this rise also in the Northeast a little bit more. It's not nearly as big as it is in some of these other states so far. Some states like here's Arkansas, you can see that Arkansas is really, it's, it's just almost going straight up at this point. Um, and so it's very worrisome. And again, this is summer. Um, we've established that there's a strong seasonal component to COVID-19. And so the fact that this is summer and we're seeing this is, is worrisome. Let me go back up once again to the global view. Um, so interestingly, there's a couple of things I want to point out first. Let me, let me go to the map. So um, even though it's, so, so we are still seeing the remnants of the Southern hemisphere because it's their winter uh, there. And so this is still uh, cold flu and, and COVID season. Um, and so we, you, we, we're still seeing quite a lot of, of infection going on there. But now we're also, we're also seeing more Delta variant in other places. Interestingly, in fact, let me see, whoops. Oh, that wasn't what I intended. All right, interestingly, when we look at um, the percentage of Delta, um, you can see the Delta, um, among cases that are reporting it, the Delta virus, uh, Delta variant is dramatically crowding out all the other variants at this point. In fact, that's not even the best way to look at it. I like looking at it this way, um, chart. So um, if you look at it just a few months ago, look at all the diversity of variants that there were. Um, at this point, like all the, all the gray is others. So there were just so many more that were under one or 2% that, they, that there were just so many different variants that were going around. But then over time, as the alpha variant, and now in particular, the Delta variant has become more common, um, the Delta you see is just crowding everything out. And the most interesting thing about this, so, so the original Wuhan variant that started this whole thing is extinct in the wild now. It no longer exists because other variants crowded it out and <laughs> it no longer replicates. It doesn't exist anymore. And so what we're seeing now is that the Delta variant is so contagious that it's driving all the other variants away. And I see this as really great news. I don't think the news is talking about this a lot yet, but the fact that it's that we're, that we're it's driving away all these potential worrisome variants, like there's other variants that have come out. Lambda has been worrisome because it might uh, help the, uh, to escape the vaccines. And the, um, uh, a bunch of these, the beta variant and, and gamma and some of these others were worrisome because they could escape the, vari uh, the vaccines. But if the Delta variant is driving them all away, it prevents further um, evolution down those paths. It cuts off those branches. And so now all of the future evolution is gonna come from this one set of branches of the Delta variant. And so I, I see this as potentially a good thing. Um, um, all right, now let's see, there's one, oh wait, a couple other things I wanted to point out here. Let's go back to cases for a second. All right, so, and I wanna look at the charts. All right, so now United Kingdom is interesting. They, so the uh, Delta variant started hitting them uh, shortly after India. So they were hit pretty hard. Um, you see how it's going down, it's dipping down. I don't trust that data right now. Um, so something interesting happened in United Kingdom on July 19th, so last Monday. And that was before that they were under um, strong restrictions. They had mandates still in place. They were uh, under kind of, sort of not, not total lockdown, but they still had heavy restrictions in place. On Monday of this past week, so July 19th, is when those restrictions were lifted. Um, and part of those restrictions that were lifted were sort of these mandatory testing that was taking place. And so I think that that's a result of the, why we see this massive drop now is because it's just a data issue. So the testing hasn't been consistent. And so now the people who are getting tested are mostly people uh, just, I, it's not, it's not the same. It's not an apples to apples comparison. Um, a lot of people believe that now since the constraints have been restricted, that this blip is going to go away. And, and the next time we meet in two weeks, uh, most of us fully expect 
that the UK will continue up on its on its upward trajectory. Um, but we don't know yet. And so this is something we're all looking at, at for. If if it continues to drop, then then the story of Delta is likely to be wrong, um, that this is going to be over a lot quicker than any of us have predicted. But really, it, we're only seeing this in the UK. And it's not, uh, there's no other explanation for it, particularly because they lifted their restraints right now, or the, the, the restrictions. Um, so so the, almost everyone I've talked to in UK about this, I've only talked to a couple, but they, they are all saying it's a data issue, not a, not a roughness. All right, um, when you look at a lot of other countries in Europe, so France, look at it's going straight up. Brazil is Southern hemisphere. So, and, and I put South Africa, South Africa here as well. Um, United States, we're going straight up. We're not quite where United Kingdom is or some of these others, um, not hitting others quite as fast. Israel is also starting to go up. Just while I have this open, you'll notice, um, let me take United States out of here for a second. So, so this is all relative to the population. It's all proportional. If I turn this off and take Brazil out as well. One, one other thing before I get rid of Brazil. So, we, so Brazil is still being hit really hard. Um, this it's the still the winter time there, and so even though Brazil doesn't have this massive peak right now, like we're seeing in the UK, they've just stayed at a pretty high level for many months now, and they're not out of the woods yet. There's still a lot of morbidity and mortality going on in Brazil. But having said that, I'm, I'm unclicking them. So now when I look at the total population, so this is total. Um, you can see that United Kingdom is simply a much larger country than Israel. And so some of the studies coming out of UK versus Israel, I would discount Israel for some of the uh, recent studies that have come out that have been disconcerting to people simply because there's so much more data in UK. And also some of the studies that were just recently published in the last couple of weeks in Israel, they just haven't been methodologically as rigorous as what we've been seeing in the UK. So I'll come back to that a little later uh, in the hour, but just so that people know, I mean, the UK, when we talk about this different sources of data, um, the UK, the data that they're reporting on typically is the whole uh, national health system there. And their health system is just much larger uh, than what we're looking at in Israel because it's a larger country. All right, enough there. All right, so now we're looking at confirmed cases. I'll bring United States back for a second, and then we can just talk about a couple of other things. So I mentioned a second ago that um, hospitalizations are rising dramatically in the United States along with the, um, the cases. Um, we don't see deaths rising a lot yet. I'll put deaths in there. Um, this is up here, total deaths. So you see that the death rate is just starting to tick up, but, uh, but there's, we know that there's typically been around a two week delay, roughly 14 days between when the cases go up and when the deaths started going up. But the one thing to note here is that, let me see if I can get this quickly. The one thing to note here is that among the um, demographic trends, it's mostly the younger people because these are the unvaccinated people that are getting infected now. And so that means that even if they're getting hospitalized, here's the age distribution. So, so we'll notice among the people that are getting, are, that are getting sick, it's, it's a little bit hard to see it right now. Um, but among the people that are getting sick, it looks very similar to the summer surge that we had last year, where you see that the, the people over the age of 65 are much smaller as a percentage of the total people. And so similar to last year, we see a rise in hospitalizations, but there's probably going to be less deaths associated with that. The issue is we, some hospitals are starting to fill up. And so we need to keep an eye on this to make sure that the hospitals don't get overloaded. Um, but the fact that, he, so, so it's terrible that people are getting hospitalized and among people who get hospitalized, the risk of long-term problems coming out of that if they need lung transplants or other things, uh, and, and even less severe things, but that have long, long-term long consequences, uh, they, they rise significantly among people who are hospitalized. So survival is shouldn't be the bar or, or shouldn't be the threshold that we look at this thing, but it's a useful quick metric we can refer to. And so there's probably gonna be a lot less mortality. However, morbidity and, and, and short, both short-term morbidity and now longer-term consequences uh, are definitely long-term issues that we need to be paying attention to. Uh, this is definitely a disease that's infecting people and, and people who were infected in March, April of last year, so 2020, there are many people who are still feeling consequences to that early infection even back then. 
And so we can't lose sight of that, that this is something that's gonna have lifelong consequences to many people who get infected and survive. <clears throat> All right, um, anything else I wanna talk about here? I think I've covered everything. One thing I can just talk about just real quickly is looking at some of the states. Um, so you, I, you can see that there's a big difference based on the vaccination. So if you look on the far right, these are the vaccination rates. The middle is the hospitalization rates increasing over the last two weeks. And then this is the case rate increasing over the last two weeks. You see that something like Alaska, which has increased by around three times, uh, the hospitalization rate has jumped dramatically. Whereas among um, uh, a state like Puerto, or Puerto Rico, which is a territory, uh, it's jumped, the caseload has jumped even higher, but because they have a higher vaccination rate, the hospitalization rate has not jumped quite as high. In fact, when you look specifically at the vaccination rate, you can see that Vermont cases have gone up, but it's mostly younger and the hospitalization rate has actually gone down over that period. Um, similarly, Massachusetts, it's they're having a spike, they're having a surge in cases right now among the unvac primarily among the unvaccinated, but the number of hospitalizations increasing is, is very small. Maine, similarly, it's barely budging, even though they've had a lot more cases reported. Um, Connecticut is is a little bit more than what than the ones than the states above them, but still relative to the increase, it's still quite small. Um, it's not until you start getting down uh, to the vaccination rates going down, um, you can where you start seeing uh, the the jumps up. So here's Florida, where the vaccination rate is at forty eight percent. They had a, a two hundred percent increase in cases and a 100% and a increase in uh, the hospitalization. And as the vaccinations decrease, then the hospitalization bump up is generally increasing uh, the, over the last couple of weeks. As not, not, not as a total rule, but, but generally that's the trend that we're seeing. All right, that's it for this. Let me close out these things. Anything else? Oh, so this is one thing that's interesting. Um, let me reload this page. So this is, these are some forecasts of what the next, uh, couple of months might look like. And uh, it, this, I like this website. It's combined a lot of different forecast sources into one ensemble forecast. Um, they are, so there's a wide range. The gray is sort of the, the range of the different forecasts. Um, the scenario, there's a bunch of scenarios they've looked at. The scenario D, I think, is by far the most likely. So this is the only one I'm going to refer to here. Scenario D uh, assumes that the vaccination rate that we're currently seeing doesn't really budge very much that we that maybe there's a, a the trend over the last month of new vaccinations will be the same trend over the next few months in terms of new vaccinations that we're not going to see a sharp spike of people suddenly realizing that science is important and they should get vaccinated um, and so if you assume that and then you assume the delta variant is as contagious as we've been uh, assuming based on the publication so far that it's roughly two to three times as contagious as what we saw in um, in January of this past year, December, January, uh, then this is the, the, um, the range of models that you'd see. Um, this is predicting that it's gonna continue um, increasing over time. I don't believe that most of these models are taking seasonality into account. And we do know that the, the um, uh, there, there is a 30 to 40% increase in transmissibility in the fall winter, uh, typically, that there's the seasonal component to it. Um, and so I, I don't know how much they're actually incorporating that. These models on average are assuming that for this surge, we're going to see a peak by around uh, the end of sept September, early to mid-October sometimes. So the peak up here is uh, mid or early to mid-October is when it's suggesting it's the peak going to be. Um, and so that's, so that's uh, what we're looking at here. Um, in terms of this is the incident cases, in terms of the death rate, this again, death isn't the only thing we're looking at, but for modeling purposes, it's one metric that's that's easier to model in some ways. And so as a result, uh, this is what they're looking at. Um, here, we're looking at uh, a weekly death rate of around 6,000, which equates to a little bit over 700, uh, between 700, 800 or so uh, death, uh, daily deaths at this point. However, you see that the gray could take it quite a bit higher. Um, and this has to do with the uncertainty. We still don't know how much more severe potential there is with the um, Delta variant. The other thing that's still uncertain is, so right now, a lot of the spread is among younger people who are unvaccinated. 
as more as the surge starts to grow, more and more people who have been previously vaccinated will presumably get infected and require hospitalization, et cetera. And as that starts to happen, um, then there's other dynamics that come into play. And so it's a little bit unclear how big this might get. Um, and so, so this is the other thing. The other uncertainty are schools and everything starting to reopen. So one thing to keep in mind, and one, one thing that we'll talk about tonight is summer camps uh, in terms of some of the experience of outbreaks in summer camps. Um, but, but previously, uh, so you know, epidemiology is an empirical science, it's all based on data and evidence. Um, previously, all of our sum of evidence on kids has indicated that the COVID, the SARS-CoV-2 does not uh, spread as effectively, as efficiently among kids, as it, or, and particularly among prepubescent kids, as it does among adults. And so typically, what we've seen over the last 18 months or so is that among kids in schools, um, for, uh, the R has typically been less than one. So if a kid got infected, they were uh, likely to infect less than one other person um, that uh, uh, after they got infected. Whereas adults uh, were much more, more likely to infect more people around them because adults are more efficient. However, now that we know that the viral load is a thousand percent higher because of the Delta variant and it's two to three times more contagious, um, it is very likely that in kids, uh, it's going to be much more contagious. And so that means that the old empirical data that we had for kids might not accurately represent what we're gonna see this fall and winter, uh, if, if it, cause it might be a completely different scenario if we start seeing uh, it more contagious in the schools um, where they're spending eight hours a day or however long they spend in these elementary schools if they're going back to school. So this is something we're gonna be uh, looking out for. In fact, uh, I don't know if I pulled out a slide on this, but the uh, pediatric, Amer one of the organizations, oh, here it is. <clears throat> so let me pull this out real quickly. Um, the American Academy of Pediatrics just recently changed its recommendations and is now um, recommending that, um, that school, schools require all students to, um, to wear masks again, even if they have vaccines. Um, and so, so this is an important change. Previously, the CDC was saying um, that if people are vaccinated, they don't have to wear masks. Um, and, and in schools, this was something that they were suggesting. The uh, American Academy of Pediatrics is now uh, con in, in conflict with that recommendation and suggesting all students ought to be wearing masks. And so this is an ongoing discussion that we'll see over the next couple of months. And all of those things together are going to be influencing uh, what the next few months look like in terms of what the potential looks like. One other thing to add here in terms of what the next few months could look like, and this goes back to, um, to this rate. So if we assume that this is the uh, fatality rate and, the, and it's similar to the infection and hospitalization rate, then what that means is that this is the likely ceiling of death. So if everyone among, so again, this is assuming that um, uh, that uh, there, that roughly one in four, let's say, uh, people are at risk because they have no immuno uh, exposure to co either the vaccine or or the virus previously. Then that means this is probably a a, a, a a rough estimate of the number of people that are likely to die. It's a, again, it's a ceiling and not an estimate of what's likely to happen, just what could happen uh, if all of them were to be uh, to be infected. Um, and so this is, and so that's something to keep in mind. Again, because um, people over the age of 65 are at much higher risk, I, I showed this last week in terms of what that could look like. Um, and my estimate was that um, among people over the age of 65, uh, a high estimate of the ceiling would be around 840,000 non-vaccinated could potentially get it uh, and then uh, could get hospitalized rather, rather than death, or death we're looking at, and that uh, 240,000 vaccinated people over the age of 65 could be hospitalized. Um, but but again, uh, that's that's assuming uh, it's it's more of a ceiling that we're looking at. So it's unlikely to to be nearly that high. Um, but but it could be. All right. So depending on how things evolve, there we're also talking about um, whether mask mandates come back in the fall. 
uh, or, or, or even earlier in the next month or two, depending on how, uh, how this spreads and, and how, how many counties start getting impacted and whether other mandates uh, start coming back into practice. Um, there's, I think there's gonna be a lot of political resistance um, to bringing some of these mandates back and that could really cause problems for some of these counties as, as numbers get uh, higher. All right, I see that it's 7.30. Let's open it up to questions. There's a lot of really interesting questions uh, this week. So let's open it back up to you. Okay, Glenn. One of the questions was, will there be a COVID outbreak in the Olympics that are going on right now? All right, interesting question. Um, let's talk about that here. <clears throat> so when you compare, this is, and again, so I'm comparing the United Kingdom, United States, and Japan. Um, in Japan, you can see that relative to the population as a whole, they're having a surge, but it's much smaller as a percentage than what we're seeing in, me, in the United States or the UK. When you look at Japan on its own, you can see that the Delta variant really is rising very rapidly. And it's on target to be similar to the surges that caused their mandates and everything to be put in place. Um, previously. And so they've said that even at this stage, the Olympics could be canceled. Um, well, here's where we are right now. So I don't know exactly what that means in terms of that. Um, here's another way of looking at this, and this is the reproductive rate. Now we've talked previously about this. If you recall, um, let me have a picture of this. Here it is. When R is less, is greater than one, that means that for everyone infected, on average, they infect more than one other person then that means that the epidemic is increasing. When the R equals one, so on average, one person infected infects one other person downstream, then it's flat. And when R is less than one, it decreases. So an interesting thing to look at is what is the transmission rate in Japan right now? And you can see that the transmission rate in Japan, one again is this break-even level. And so the, based on the surges, that's how fast it was going. Japan is not simply increasing it's increasing at a faster rate. And so that's also problematic because that's, it's, it's increasing at a faster rate. So this is what people are paying attention to. Now, one thing you might not have known about is that for all of the athletes competing in the Olympics, they've created a playbook on how to deal with COVID. And the playbook is 70 pages long on all the requirements for dealing with COVID uh, with the Olympics. So they are monitoring this heavily. There's a ton of testing and tracing. They have, they've really thought every, uh, through all best practices of how they could address this and find it. And so far, here's what they found. The first case was identified uh, involving uh, the Olympics with a Japanese contractor June 29th, the first person in the media July 3rd. From there, it started to increase. The first athlete case was July 14th. Um, July 16th, it was the first person to be hospitalized. By July, July 17th, the case count went up to 45. July 23rd, which was a couple of days ago, the case count there is now up to 91 people, including 10 athletes. So um, you see it's increasing, that's where we are. They are monitoring it. There's a dashboard that they have uh, that I did not link to here, um, but, but that's where we are. Um, a lot of these cases, um, it's still unclear how much of it is spread due to local spread there versus how much of this came with the delegates as they attended. And it was just simply brought there from other places. Um, and so that's still unclear, whether this is an outbreak or it's just people coming to the Olympics still with COVID-19. And so uh, either asymptomatic or, or symptomatic. All right, so that's where we are with that. That's, I, I don't have any more information about that. Okay, all right. I just read today that the um, efficacy of the, of the Pfizer vaccine um, after a period of six months um, is not nearly as effective as in the beginning. And then they, I read that the booster shots might take quite a few months for the approval of them. So the next question was, will we need a booster shot in the fall? And would you answer these other questions as well? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, so this is still an open question. Um, I think that it will be likely, just personally, I think it's going to be likely that specific subpopulations will have eligibility. Um, I think in particular, people over age, over age 65, uh, the immunocompromised or immunos those who are immunocompromised or on immunosuppressant therapy, 
and other high risk populations. I, I think that these subpopulations who are at highest risk uh, will probably uh, be uh, eligible for booster shots, but I don't know yet. The, the reality is that so far in the United States, uh, this, the studies that I've seen so far are not suggesting that there's a decrease. And, and that's why there's sort of this uh, conflicting messaging going on between the CDC, FDA uh, on one side saying they're not needed versus the, um, or, or not needed so far versus Pfizer uh, saying, well, we do want them to be, to be given out. Now, interestingly, France, Israel, and the UK are planning. They're either have already started to, to uh, give out the third dose as a booster shot, or they're planning to administer a third shot uh, in September. And so I, I think that if, you know, if they're already talking about it publicly, I think that that increases the likelihood that in the United States, we're gonna follow their lead. Um, but like I said, the, 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 uh, the, there's still a tremendous amount of efficacy. Now let's talk about a few different components of this. So when I think of the vaccines, there's basically four components. One is whether someone could get infected and whether it prevents infection. And that's sort of like sterilizing immunity. The second is whether they get infected, but then uh, have severe symptoms. The third is whether they're infected and are hospitalized. And the fourth is whether they can transmit the virus to other people. And so what we know so far is that, I don't know if I pulled this out here. Um, no, I didn't pull this out in this slide, but we talked about it last week, is that the things that have been falling that you might be reading about are the infection rate. So people might still be able to get infected, but generally the symptoms are very, very minor. So they're asymptomatic they're, or they have minor cold-like symptoms, all right? Um, some of the, some of the uh, um, fall has also been among severe cases. And so by severe cases, we're talking about people who get hit hard with it, but don't require hospitalization. So they feel really bad. Uh, they get hot. So despite the vaccine, they're still uh, off their feet for a week or more. It just feels, they feel really bad, but it's not, doesn't require hospitalization. What's really good is that the, this key metric among people who get COVID-19 after they're vaccinated and require hospitalization, the UK data, again, this was a really good data because it's so many people that they're looking at, um, that suggested that it's 96% protective still. So only 4% of people who would have gotten hospitalized previously are now getting hospitalized after the vaccine. Again, at a personal level, this is great for, for individuals because the risk is low. At a population level, as the spread continues and you're just increasing the rolling of the dice, then that means at the population level, we will see increases in hospitalization just because there's more people who are going to, to trigger those 4%. Um, the last thing that we've been talking about is transmission. And the problem with transmission is that if you have all of these vaccinated people who are walking around asymptomatically or, or with minor symptoms uh, and are spreading it to other people, the vaccinated people might be protected themselves but then might be spreading it to all of these unvaccinated people. And so these vaccinated people might be silent but deadly. And so it just might increase the risk to the people who are unvaccinated because there's all of these people walking around who seem like totally healthy, who might be infecting them and putting them in the hospital. And that's really an increased risk for unvaccinated and they don't seem to be aware of this problem. Um, so, so that's th those are the things we're looking at. Again, the key takeaway here is that the key metric, uh, even in Israel, uh, it's been validated. So Israel that's been finding that it's that, that there's less protection that they're talking about, they still find high protection uh, of around 90 percent, 89, 90 percent uh, or higher uh, protection from hospitalization. Uh, and, and again, UK found 96 percent protection from hospitalization. Um, and so, so that's good news. So I'll, with that, I'll, I'll leave it with that. I'll, I'll keep tracking it and we can talk about it uh, the next time we meet. Okay, Harry has, has a question regarding this. Yeah, coming from the research that's uh, out of uh, Israel and France, what are their researches showing as far as the need for 
a different drug company for the third vaccination? In other words, do you want to get it from the same company or do you want to get it from the booster, a, the booster from a different company? Yeah, that's a really good question. I don't know yet whether it makes a huge difference between the mRNA vaccines, but they've definitely found that among people whose first vaccine was an adenovirus vaccine. So say AstraZeneca, uh, which was approved abroad or one of the Chinese vaccines or others, uh, or uh, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine in the United States, that if you have a booster shot with the mRNA vaccine, it's better than simply getting the, the previous vaccine again. Um, and so that, that would probably, I would expect, would be something that we see. Personally, I don't think we're gonna see a lot, of, a lot more Johnson & Johnson vaccine distributed by the, win by the fall and winter. I think almost everyone's gonna be getting the, the mRNA vaccines at that point um, for a variety of reasons. Um, and then in, the one other thing that I'll mention is that if you may recall that in the United States, we gave the, we tried to vaccinate, to, to fully vaccinate as many people as we could early on. Uh, and so what that meant was uh, giving the first dose of either Pfizer or, or Moderna, um, and then either three or four weeks after giving the second dose as quickly as we could. In contrast, in the United Kingdom, they tried to give the first dose to as many people as they could, and they postponed giving the second dose. They, they are at this point in time right now in July, they have more, a lot more people have had the second dose because they've, they've all gotten it by now. But having said that, um, because there was a more, uh, more time between the first dose and the second dose, that might change some of what we're seeing. In Israel, a lot more people got the second dose sooner, like we had in the United States. That might influence the efficacy in some way, and we don't know yet. So for instance, in the United Kingdom, so far, based on some of the early studies I've seen, they think that the sweet spot of the time between the first dose and second dose to maximize the benefit was around eight weeks. And so our three to four week period might not have optimized how, how much efficacy we might see. And as a result, we may be a little bit lower than the United Kingdom and more towards Israel. But even still, the fact that it's 90% protection against hospitalization is still good news. However, when you look at that the other way, so if you say 96%, let's say it's roughly 4% or 5% of people who are hospitalized, who, who, of those who would have been hospitalized, and now it's going to be more like 10%, then that's almost a doubling. And so that's, that's a little bit worrisome. Again, this is something we're gonna need to be worried about at a population level for sure, but still at a personal level, these vaccines are extremely effective at keeping most people out of the hospital uh, if they would have been otherwise hospitalized. Okay, so what is the, uh, the knowledge right now as far as booster shots, uh, having more adaptability to new variants, to Delta and to potential other, th other, other stuff? So, so all of the, what I've just told you is all on the Delta variant. So, so we have really good data at this point on the Delta variant. And so right now it's holding up. The Delta variant is not as well protected as some of these others. So if you recall um, back like months ago, um, we were talking about 95% protection from severe symptoms. Whereas now because of the Delta variant that's dropped a lot. So a lot more people are getting severe symptoms. However, this critical number that we're still looking about it, hospitalizations, rather than simply having severe symptoms, the hospitalizations is still holding, it's, hold, it's holding uh, the barrier. So, so that's still good news. Um, but, but like I said, so far the Delta variant is, uh, is that we, we have this data. The other thing is Delta is still evolving. So there's the Delta plus variant that people are talking about, which is still basically Delta, but it might have a little bit more in, uh, ability to escape out of the vaccines. It's still protected, uh, but, but it might be a little bit more, uh, so it might just nudge it. Um, at this point, we don't have any reason to think that that hospitalization rate is still being budged yet, but we are tracking it. So far, those are the best estimates that we have. Okay. All right. All right. Um, the next person asked, do the COVID vaccines secretly have microchips? 
Yeah, this is, I, I didn't even think this was an issue. Um, and then I looked at the survey, people started talking about it. The survey came out by The Economist um, uh, just a couple of weeks ago, I think, some, sometime recently, oh, July 10th to 13th is when they conducted it. Um, and it suggested that one in five Americans believes the US government is secretly using the COVID vaccine to microchip the population. So essentially to inject microcomputers and, and make a cyborgs using the vaccine. And in fact, when you look at the unvaccinated who are largely the ones that are talking about it, only a third of them, so among people who are, who, who are not getting vaccinated, only a third are convinced that no, this is silly. <laughs> like literally the two thirds are either convinced they are doing it or are not sure if the government is trying to purposely in, uh, implant micro uh, microcomputers into people using the vaccine. Uh, this is for me astonishing. It seems insane, but I I brought I I uh, put this on my my personal Facebook account, and people some people said, oh no, that's not so strange to them. So I figured, okay, why don't I go through the the exercise of just describing why this is such a an insane thing to discuss? All right, microchips. So we do use microchips in dogs and cats so that we can know uh, how to track them. And so the technology does exist. Um, the size of the um, of here, the size of the um, of the microchip is roughly the size of a grain of rice. So these are pretty large things, um, and these microchips, because they're so large, require very large needles. This is the needle that's used to insert a microchip in dogs and cats, and this is the size of the needle that's used for vaccinations. So you can see here a vaccination needle going into an arm, how it's really, really small. And you can see here the size of the needle going into the dogs. It doesn't hurt the dogs. They don't have a lot of nerves that there, so don't worry. Uh, but, but you can see they're very different needles. So when people go to get vaccinated, you can see they're very different needles. The other thing, and so these, these um, vac uh, uh, microchips that are put into dogs, um, they only can be here, I'll show you this picture, they only are sort of dead chips. There's no battery operations there. There's not, they're not microcomputers. It requires an external wavelength of something to trigger it. And that's, what, uh, that's why you need sort of a scanner to sort of scan this kind of thing. It's a, a powerful scanner that scans the dogs. In order for it to transmit or to record any information or, or anything like that, then if you require what we see here, these much, much larger devices that you see on dog collars that are all massive. It has to be bigger in order to have any kind of signaling capability. So if it's a Wi-Fi signal or a cellular signal or anything else, Bluetooth, anything, it requires a much more massive size. And in order to be able to transmit, it requires energy, it requires a battery of some kind that requires uh, first of all, if it's going to last for a long period of time, it would require a really large size. And that is not something that can be transmitted in a needle uh, in 2021. This is something you could imagine. So there are sci-fi fantasy shows on Netflix and, and TV shows and, and movies that already incorporate these into the storylines. And so there's a lot of um, movie magic. So the special effects that already have storylines where in regular vaccine needles, they can be put in. However, in 2021, this is not reality and we don't have the technology. If it existed, I would know about it. And there's not a conspiracy unless it's, I'm involved in the conspiracy and I'm not, I have no motivation to be involved in such a conspiracy. Um, and so this is something to know. For the one last thing I'll mention here before I put it to rest, I mean, just you can just look at the size of the needle. The one other thing before I put this to rest, is that if this conspiracy existed uh, in 2021, it would require the, the uh, Make America Great Trump supporters, remember they were in office and, and populated the federal government before uh, Trump left office. So when the vaccines were being developed, the federal government had at all the highest levels, these Trump appointees, it would have required them to be in on the conspiracy as well as the Biden administration, all the leftist government uh, officials that replaced the MAGA Trump officials. It would require adversarial foreign governments. So Iran and China and, and Russia that we're in uh, adversarial relationships with would have to be in on it 
with us because they're giving the same vaccines to their populations. Um, it would have to be, a cons the conspiracy would involve independent publicly owned pharmaceutical companies would all have to be in on it. And that, and plus public health organizations, medical scientists, and many other people, plus the independent media. The, the, there would be thousands of people that would need to be involved on in this. And it would be, it's insane to think that anyone could keep that kind of secret without me or, or the masses knowing about it. The one other thing that would be involved in just simply manufacturing and monitoring that's for these billions of doses so far, a lot of you might not realize, but over 2 billion people around the world, so that's billion with a B, have already received at least one dose of the vaccine. Hundreds of millions in the United States alone, but 2 billion around the world. So this would require a manufacturing infrastructure and organizational infrastructure, monitoring infrastructure, and simply project management that we're talking about many thousands of people in addition to that, that's a global network working on this. And you, that this is way more than was required to put a, a person on the moon decades ago. And we would have heard about it. There's no way to hide this kind of thing. So there is no conspiracy here going on. So, so going back to this, if this is what's driving people to not get vaccines, this one thing, then, we, then this is, I mean, it's insane. So um, then we need to talk about that. All right, uh, next question. Okay. Have there been an increase in summer colds? So this is really interesting. Uh, yes, yes. In fact, um, this is almost unprecedented. So if you recall, so what we're looking at here are all the different cold and flu viruses that hit every year. And so there's uh, some companies that track the lab data of the variation in, um, in the cold and flu viruses. So bacteria, parainfluenza, um, adenovirus, uh, other coronaviruses that just cause colds, influenza A, influenza B. Um, and so what you saw was that in the lockdowns and the severe restrictions that we saw in the United States back in March and April, not only did it have a real big effect on COVID-19, it also dramatically reduced the spread of cold and flu. If you're over here, what we're looking at, the green, light green is influenza A, dark green is, is uh, influenza B. You can see that flu dramatically was knocked down. And to this day, flu spread is still very, very, very low. I mean, it's summer now, so you wouldn't expect it. However, cold viruses have are typically a lot more contagious. And that's why you, so, you see so much spread typically. However, they have a seasonal pattern. There's cold and flu season, which is typically fall and winter and summer you see a decrease. And so, but summer, it doesn't decrease as much as you would see, but, but there's still a decrease. But because there's been so much mask wearing and physical distancing and whatnot, the cold virus hasn't had a chance to spread generally, uh, except for blue, except for the human rhinovirus, the enterovirus. This one has been so contagious that it was even, even able to bypass our, our masks uh, just among the people who weren't as effective at wearing them. However, and, and this is interestingly, this was this sort of um, was one of the reasons that there was this debate early on in terms of whether we should wear masks for COVID-19 is we didn't know what it would look like. Would it look more like the blue here that we're looking at, the, the human rhinovirus and the enterovirus, where the mask really wouldn't make much of a difference? And so why bother going through this theater if it didn't make much of a difference? Now we know it did make a huge difference. It reduced it by around 40 to 50% on average, but we didn't know at the time. And, that, and so that's why uh, we, there, there was this delay in making that recommendation. But now the colds are enormous. In fact, where we are now is roughly where we were at the peak of cold and flu season in December, January of 2020 before COVID-19. And it's probably only going to increase, especially as cold and flu season starts to hit in the next couple of months. So um, a lot of people are worried that this next, this upcoming fall and winter will be one of the largest cold and flu seasons we've had in a while. And so that's something that we're, that we're uh, thinking about as well. However, it's, it's not gonna be COVID-19. The worry is that when you have a lot of these cold and flu viruses that start to come back, they look, some of the symptoms look like COVID-19. And so people might start going to the hospital when they don't necessarily need to because they're worried they have COVID-19 based on the symptoms. And that could be uh, problematic as well. Um, and plus we found that there are different um, treatment that you use for COVID-19 versus flu. That was one of the early things we found 
is that, for instance, ventilation. For flu, you would typically ventilate someone earlier, and that was the best practice for flu when their oxygen levels start to fall. Whereas for COVID-19, the best practice has been to delay putting people on ventilation, even if their oxygen levels fall, because it has better effect if you delay it for COVID-19. So the worry is, if someone comes in with cold uh, with a flu versus COVID-19, uh, which treatments do you start them on first? Luckily, our tests are pretty accurate and are pretty fast now, so it shouldn't be too much of a problem, but this is just something some people have been worried about. Anyway, that's enough on that. Okay. Next question. Okay, have there been COVID outbreaks in summer camps? Good question. Now that a lot of kids are already in summer camp, this is not something a lot of parents are gonna to wanna to hear about, but let's just talk about some of the studies that have taken place. This one study uh, was um, a sleepaway camp in Georgia. Um, there were 627 people who attended the sleeping camp, or the sleepaway camp, including um, uh, staff, trainees, 363 campers, uh, and the ages were roughly age five to 17. All right, there were two studies published. Here's the first one. All right, so this is the summer camp. There was uh, an introductory staff member uh, arrival where it was just the early staff arrived. There was an orientation period. Then the campers arrived. You can see that there. this was the, I think June, the end of June and then early July. So it wasn't a long camp. It was just, a, a, you can see a week or two. The dotted lines here represent when the people were there and when they left. The colored uh, numbers, the hist histogram represents when people got sick. The key takeaway here is that the black uh, uh, dots are people who uh, were the index cases. These are people who arrived at the camp infected without realizing it. They, everyone was required before they attended camp, everyone was required to have a negative test result uh, before they, uh, within 12 days of arrival, they were required to have a negative test result. Then when they arrived, they were given a new test. And so these were people who tested positive after they arrived, but it was already too late. The spread it was uh, uh, of this uh, variant already started spreading fast. By the time that this small suburb camp was over, um, and again, this was um, uh, only a week or two that we're talking about here, um, roughly half of all the people there were infected with COVID-19. Mm. Um, in particular, and so it's a uh, um, 52 per, and, and so this was a, uh, and, and they tried to separate bunks. Let me, let me pull out some other information. So they tried to separate lots and lots of different cabins and they thought, well, if there's an outbreak in one cabin and the one cabin just keeps to itself, then at least they won't infect the other cabins around them. And so it will be a way to isolate it. But they found that despite there were separate, the separate cabins, it had no effect in virtually every cabin, except it looks like this one cabin that virtually every cabin had an, had an outbreak in it. All right, the, the issue, let me just I'll talk just a couple more minutes about this. When you look at the rate of spread, uh, we've talked about this R, this reproductive value. Um, the reproductive value reached a high, and this is an instantaneous reproductive number, which is not quite the same thing, but for all intents and purposes, we can think of it as essentially the same. The high reached around 10, where on this early part when the campers first started arriving and they first started getting infected, each infected person was infecting on average around 10 other people that day or so. Um, and so this was rapidly spreading. Um, the other thing, so most of these campers did not have symptoms. Let me see if I can pull this out. Um, there was a lot of asymptomatic uh, infection. Uh, they were young kids. And so, so that's what you would expect. So now, interestingly, so after this study was published or, or after this uh, outbreak was identified, there was one study, one group of people looking at this component during the summer camp. A lot of people were interviewed, trying to understand what happened, what could be, what, what, what could be learned. But then another group followed the people home and interviewed the houses to see what would happen after these kids went home. And what did they find? All right, so what they found was that 12% of those, um, uh, so after they went home, they, um, they uh, tested the, or, or they asked for the test results among the different households that the kids were part of, and 12% of those tested had positive results. 
So among the kids who went home from camp, some of them got sick at camp, but before the end of camp, they no longer were infectious. Some of them were infectious. Um, and so 72% of, the, of these were, were tested for SARS-CoV-2 and with positive results, and 12% of those of people afterwards had positive results. However, more interesting is that 18% of households, almost one in five households, uh, got infected, got at least one person there infected after the kids returned home. And in the households that were infected, almost half of the people who lived in those houses ended up getting infected. Hmm. All right, so this, is, so this is something to think about. Um, when people come home from camp, if, people have, if these kids have been in camp for a while, then it's less worrisome because even if they got COVID-19, um, they, they are less likely to be infected or, or not, not even infected. They're less likely to be infectious. Uh, when they get home. So less likely to be contagious. And so that at least is good. However, even after they get home, it might be a good idea to um, to, to uh, at least wear masks or whatever, particularly if there are higher risk people at home uh, after afterwards. Um, and so they looked at physical distancing after people got home, how if that prevented, and yes, maintaining physical distancing for a few days after had a huge effect, uh, reduced it uh, 70% or, or 60 to 70%. People who wore masks around uh, all the time for the few, for the uh, days following their return, it reduced it by 50% or more uh, in terms of their likelihood of getting infected. So this is something to think about when kids return from camp. This is just one camp. Um, again, the summer is still pretty early, so this is still something that, that we're going to be paying attention to. But already, we already have some examples of this. This isn't the only one. There are other camps um, that have published some information. So particularly with the Delta variant, this is something we're gonna to need to worry about. All right, it's, uh, let's just see if there's one or two more questions and then we okay, can- Okay, there's, there's one more question. I know that it's, it's now getting close to the end of time. Um, we wanna know, can you tell us about the Guillain-Barre syndrome in Johnson & Johnson vaccine? Yeah, so the, so the Guillain-Barre syndrome, um, it's, um, it's, a fair, it's, a, it's a serious thing. Uh, for a lot of people, it's self-correcting, or or after uh, being treated, hospitalized, it, it, they go back and and uh, it's not a long-term disease that it, that uh, takes place. Um, but it has been uh, identified as a legitimate possibility with the Johnson and Johnson vaccine. Um, so so far, um, roughly a hundred people um, have been. Uh, do I have any more information here? So roughly. Um, there have been a hundred preliminary reports of GBS uh, following the J and J vaccine. In the original Johnson and Johnson clinical trial for the vaccine, only one case was identified. So this is a very rare event. And for people who got it after the J and J vaccine, uh, it occurred typically within around ten days or so uh, after the vaccination. So um, if anyone who was vaccinated with Jane J uh, weeks or months ago, this is not a concern for them. However, there were issues with J and J before. Um, and so just because as, as an adenovirus, and so as a result, um, this is probably another reason that people might not want to get the J and J vaccine. Also, J and J now has a little bit less efficacy um, or, or a, re a fair amount of less efficacy than the mRNA vaccines as we go into the, the coming months, especially with the Delta variant. And so I suspect that Johnson & Johnson uh, recipients may be more also more likely to get the booster shot as a result. Um, a couple other things. So, so typically, uh, and this is something to keep in mind, uh, uh, so among the, the reports that they had of GBS following the vaccine, uh, first, of, uh, so 95 of them were serious and required hospitalization and there was one death. So this is something to follow, even though it is very, very rare. Again, uh, so just to point out, there were 12 and a half million doses of J&J &J administered. And of those 12 and a half million, 95 hospitalizations came out of this and one person died. Um, and so this, the, for those people, it was a severe issue, but the risk we're talking about is very, a very low risk among people. And, and, this, and, and it would have happened already for people because uh, it was evaluated it, within that short period of time, within the one to two weeks after that vaccination. The other thing is that GBS 
occurs generally in the population in the United States uh, to around 3,000 to 6,000 people. So the number of additional GBS cases uh, is very small relative to the total amount of GBS that happens anyway naturally. Um, so this is that's something to keep in mind as well. The other couple of things that uh, of, of answers to questions that are, that are related to this that people might have, can you get GBS from COVID-19 itself? Not the vaccine, but the infection from being naturally infected. Um, the answer is yes, it's uncommon, but it does seem to happen. And so with the, uh, the uh, Johnson & Johnson vaccine, is it the vaccine that's causing it or is it the um, simply the, the fact that it's for COVID-19 and there's something involved with COVID-19 that's triggering it. The fact that co people with COVID-19 infection are getting it, so there have it's pretty rare, um, but th there are some, then that could be something interesting that's going on. So far, we've found that it's more common among people over the age of, of uh, 59, among males um, and uh, people who uh, were, were symptoms and severity of COVID-19, GBS were similar to non-COVID. Uh, GBS. All right. When you the, the another question is, can you get GBS from vaccines like other vaccines, regardless of COVID nineteen? And so they have found increased GBS for some other vaccines. So for instance, it's been linked to new shingles vaccine, sometimes to flu vaccine, uh, and etc. So sometimes the vaccines can uh, have a, a risk of GBS again. We're talking about very rare events here. Um, so even for Johnson and Johnson, among the 12 and a half million doses administered, and again, Johnson and Johnson, remember, was a one dose uh, regimen. So among the 12 and a half million doses administered, less than a hundred of those uh, were, were had this severe disease to be worried about. So um, so, but but because this exists. Um, it's another reason that people, it's not something that we have found in the mRNA vaccines. And so as a result, this is probably yet another reason to get the mRNA vaccines that have been, the mRNA vaccines have been given to hundreds of millions of people at this point. Um, and so we just have even more safety and efficacy data uh, because there's just so many more people that we've been tracking them. Okay. Well, um, I, the next thing we need to talk about is your next webinar, which appears yes, to be August 8th. Would that be good for you, Glenn? Yes, right. August 8th is perfect. Okay, we're going to put on our calendars for August 8th at 7 o'clock to meet again. And we want to thank everybody for coming tonight. Thank you very much, Glenn, for all of your information, which is always wonderful. And we'll see you in a couple of weeks. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Arlene. Have a great two weeks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.